here are the problems. This is John Hausman in his Academy Award-winning turn as a law professor. All of this is reinforced socially, right? You have this intimidating fellow here. You, that's you with the bad hair and tie if you're a white dude with bad hair and a tie. Um, and it makes you feel like this. You feel tiny when you're in class. And so you feel pressure to do these things, to read cases and brief them, to be really on top, to be prepared for class. The case method is a time suck. Briefing cases, uh, my first two tutoring students, uh, I asked them what happened. Uh, they, they, the, the first time I started tutoring in the spring, like six, I, I guess now it's seven years ago. Um, and, and I asked and I just guessed, like, let me guess, you spent the entire semester briefing cases. These two guys, one was from Fordham, one was from NYU. Oh, never forget them. They were really earnest guys. They worked super hard. They were super smart. And they, um, and, and they just chose the wrong strategy. One of them did kind of finished outlines and took a single practice exam and got straight B's. The other guy didn't outline and didn't practice exam because he was up until the night before his first exam briefing cases. Um, I have materials on this anywhere. I don't want to belabor this. You can look up Don't Brief Cases, Larry Lala on YouTube, and you'll find like, I think I've done three videos in which I kind of scream. Um, and yet the Socratic method creates fear uh, and it's, it's a way of enforcing obedience to the professor. Social pressure. The other thing about working so hard at like reading cases, there's a subtler thing in that a lot of us are used to getting output if we put in tons of input. If our exam... Um, you know, in the past, if we worked really hard in the exam, we got a result. And so because we don't know what we're doing this early into the semester, work becomes a form of stress relief. If we really prepare, we believe that um, we'll deserve a good grade or we'll get some kind of return. But it's not true if we pursue the wrong strategy. Here's the other problem with doing what your professor tells you to do. There's the curve. As I said before, you're, you're in law school with peers. Um, if your scores were a little higher, you'd be at a different law school with different peers. If your scores were a little lower, your GPA was a little lower, you'd be at a different school with different peers. They are, so as a rule, you should assume that the people sitting next to you are just as smart, if not smarter, and just as hardworking as you are. So logical problem. I wish I never took symbolic logic in, in, in philosophy. I can draw this out. But the reasoning stands. If you're equally smart and equally hardworking and you're pursuing exactly the same strategy as 50 other people or 100 other people in your section, how exactly are you going to get better grades? Uh, that's a rhetorical question, but if someone has an answer, I'd, I'd uh, I'd really uh, love to know. Yes, David, it's my mantra, sorry. So here's the other way of going about it. No one's, um, these graphics are too subtle and not that cool anyway. Uh, so uh, my younger kid started chess. I'm not that much of a tiger parent. She did chess because her best friend, she's like five, uh, is in, in the weekly chess class. But uh, the way chess is taught, so I understand, I don't go to the classes myself, uh, you start learning with the end game, with very few pieces uh, to show how you can maneuver, like just uh, basically, it'll be like king versus king and pawn. Uh, how you can maneuver king and pawn to put the other king in checkmate. Uh, 
And then you don't start with the opening. You don't start with a board that's fully loaded and start at the beginning. You start at the end to learn what's important because the end is where you want to be. And then everything else that you learn can be built out from there. Tim Bottoms. Uh, so what's the right question here? Uh, I think the right question are what skills do I need to do well on the final exam? That sounds like a self-evident kind of question, but it's, it's really focusing. What skills do I need to do well on the final exam? And then the second one is, is that bundle of things that the professor told me to do, are those things going to help me uh, develop my skills to prepare for the final exam? I described what a final exam is like, but let me take a different approach. Uh, a final exam, a lot, you, you'll never, in some ways it's totally artificial and stupid. You'll never be forced to give legal advice under three hours uh, on something that you've never seen without access to anything but your case book and maybe your own outline. You'll, that is artificial. What is absolutely fair about the exam is, um, the general format. You're given generally a fact pattern and, um, and you have to solve a problem. Your client, and uh, it wasn't, so I've been at a big law firm and a small law firm and I'm not, I, I, I work in government now and I can't tell you where, I might have to kill all of you. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. I, I totally don't work in any death related regulator. Of course, that's what someone who would tell you if they worked at a place that killed people. But anyway, uh, when I worked at a smaller law firm, this actually happened. You know, the, the whole kind of uh, detective thing where you're sitting in and uh, a dame with stams walks in and, you know, the, the whole bad Bogart accent. And they tell you a story. And on the private investigators case, they're supposed to go out, take those clues and figure something out. Your adventure is a little more boring. You get to sit at your desk and think about, hmm, uh, given these facts that I've just heard that I've never heard before, uh, can my client sue? What would the other person say? What would the other party say? Would I be able to win? That's basically what a what a, a final exam is assessing. And you can filter then what you learn through those questions. So this is kind of what you need to know uh, to answer these questions. Um, you need legal knowledge. Uh, but in forming a claim, let's say you know, your client came in and said somebody uh, threw a pie at my face. Um, We'll talk about issue spotting later, but basically you'll see it yourself. That sounds like battery. Let me run through the elements of battery. Battery is uh, an intentional and offensive touching without consent. That's one formulation of it. So you can sue someone for punching you or touching you in a way that you don't want to be touched. Uh, that includes pies or things thrown at you, um, whatever. Uh, you will have read a bunch of cases on battery, things like an interesting case where someone's cane is hit. Um, is that battery? You didn't hit the guy, but you hit his cane. Uh, struck, his, struck his car, bicycle. Uh, you set up a, a, a gun to explode, or you set up a trap. Is that battery? Um, okay, so you'll read, read a lot of cases in a lot of detail, but ultimately, um, the knowledge that you need for the exam is the black letter law itself. Just that out, that intentional and offensive touching without consent. And then some nuances to know some of the other cases like hitting someone's cane is actually an offensive touching, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So that's one filter. How much legal knowledge do you need? The short answer is memorizing every word of every case that you've read will not help you with this and may fill your head with things that, that aren't helpful. Um, or obsessing about that is, the, is not the point. It's, it's to walk away with enough that you can assess claims. 
then you need practice answering uh, a answering an issue spotting exam. The first is actually analyzing an issue because it's not that, it's not as easy as you would think to simply decide if something is an intentional and offensive touching without consent. There is some skill in walking through that rigorously in an objective way uh, that your professor wants on an exam. And yet remember that the overall skill, the one thing that this is called that what you're doing on the exam. It's called, it's called an issue spotting exam. Most people don't break it out into these separate pieces, uh, but only part of it is analyzing. Once you've found an issue, can you analyze it? Maybe that's the easy part. The hard part is how do you find the issue? How do you know to even run through an analysis? It's not just deciding, if there's, there are not going to be fully formed claims set out on your final exam. There are just going to be hints at things or maybe a single fact that touches on a single element. How do you spot the issue? Okay, a lot of that will be Greek to you, but you'll, you'll remember this, and I do teach about this. Okay, so legal knowledge, working with issue spotting exams, and then the last thing is selling an argument to the judge. In a way, your professor is the first judge you will ever argue a case to uh, because the professor is the only person who decides what grade that you get. And issue spotting exams are highly subjective. That doesn't mean that there is no objective way of deciding between whether an exam is good or bad. But within a group of pretty good exams, what makes a pretty good exam and an outstanding exam is highly subjective. And you have to develop the people skills, in essence, to be able to do this. Reading your professor, seeing what kinds of arguments that they like, that's a whole thing that you will need to develop to do if, if your aim is to get an A on the exam.